All right, here we are again. Welcome back to another episode of the Mosh and Says Show. We are oh, super sorry. pumped. He is one half of the WWF Tag Team Champions. He is on the Legends deal with WWE. And I'm here too. And today, we're going to discuss a smorgasbord of topics. Namely, right off the bat, Chaz, we're going to talk about the fight everybody's talking about. Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul. That's going to lead us into a conversation about aging in professional wrestling. Aging in contact sports. Whether you can still lace them up or whether it's time to ride off into the sunset. And also, a big thing that was a factor in this fight. Showmanship. Promos. Hyping up a fight that's a big deal of everything that is done in the world of professional wrestling. But right off the bat, Tyson Paul, what would you think, Jazz? Um, I thought it was exactly what I expected it to be. Um, I didn't expect a, a Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier fight. Um, I expected pretty much what we got, which was supposed to be entertainment. Um, I, don't even, I don't even know if it was really entertaining. But I know there's 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 all kinds of controversy about it. And I was walking actually walking the dog yesterday and my next door neighbor's like, Well, ask Chaz. He knows he knows about that stuff. And I was like, What are you asking me about? They're like, the Paul Tyson fight. I'm like, what about it? And they're like, Well, was it fixed? And I'm like, listen, I said, in my opinion, and I'm gonna throw my opinion out there very strongly here, the only thing more scripted than wrestling is boxing. I mean, it's been that way. It's been that way for years. And I've heard different things from different people. Um, one person, the, the one thing that I heard, and again, this is hearsay. I don't know if it's 100% true. But the contract that were signed was basically if one of them knocked the other one out, they would get paid less money. Oh. So the, the deal was to go eight rounds. The, you know, the deal was – with Tyson was to only have two minute rounds. Mm -hmm. But the thing is this is what I think a lot of people are missing. It's just, it's, it's, it's showmanship. It's, it's a show. It's entertainment. It was to make money and they clearly made money. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, I look at it. Whereas I even had a friend of mine post on um, here. Let me read it to you. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, you seem to be one of the few who tempered their expectations, but we were talking off camera and you had a uh, very interesting critique to put it nicely that uh, you're going to share with us now. <laughs> um, yeah. So my friend writes, he wrote on Facebook. If that doesn't make you hate the Paul family, I don't know what will imagine scamming 80,000 people into buying tickets for that shit. Hold on. Buying that shit. I mean, did you really think it was going to be, like I said, a Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier fight? No. It, you, you, you weren't going to get that out of them. You know, I'm trying to think of the right, the right words because I totally just lost it with a brain fart. But you, you weren't going to get that kind of fight. It was all about, you know, because you, here, here's the thing. You're not going to, they're not going to allow Tyson to get knocked out. He's no. a freaking legend. They're not going to let, Jake Paul knock out Mike Tyson. They're not going to allow Tyson to knock out Jake Paul because Jake Paul, as he calls himself the new face of boxing, even though these aren't real boxing matches, if you look at the people he's fought, none of them have been boxers except for two of them. One, the guy was 58 years old, and the other guy he lost to. So he's not a real boxer. So these are all just exhibitions yeah. to, pay, to make money. But – the one thing I got out of it, and I didn't see it all. I, I had I, I had softball on Friday night. It got done late. I got home just in time, really, to watch the, the Tyson part of it. But from what I heard, the undercard match, especially the women's boxing, was unbelievable, which I didn't see it at all. But my whole take on it is, again, I was not expecting a five-star, you know, a, an old-school brawl. I was expecting what we got because, in my opinion – if you watch the first couple of rounds, Tyson getting in there, and almost there was a couple of times he was pulling jabs back, it looked like. In my opinion, if he wanted to knock Jake Paul out, he could have knocked him out in the first or second oh, round. Yeah. That's my opinion. But yeah. the whole thing was just – it was a show. It was an exhibition. And that's yeah. all Jake Paul is. And they actually, I don't know if you've seen it. I've seen it online where it says, so I have to tell my grandkids that this is the guy that Mike Tyson lost to. And it was like an old video of Jake Paul, skinny as a – Skinny is a stick, like doing like the running man in his bedroom. Or oh, my God. One of his old YouTube videos. 
I mean, I've never seen this stuff, but I don't know. So, what like about you? Said, you? It's, a spect- it's a spectacle. It's yeah. a special attraction. Jake Paul is a commodity. You know, the people he's calling out, Manny Pacquiao, um, Lennox Lewis, they're senior citizens. You know, maybe not Pacquiao so much, but he's 48, I think. Lennox right. Lewis is 58. He he doesn't want to fight. Like you said, he's not a real boxer. He doesn't want to no. get in there with, with anybody in there that can knock his teeth out. And who was it? It was um, it was Dana White who called him out and said, fight someone your own age and your own size. And it was that, what, was that guy's name? Fury? Somebody, something, Tommy Tyson Fury. Fury? Tyson Fury. And he lost to him. So it's like that, that right there tells you anything Jake Paul does is exhibition to draw money. And he, and he does it. I mean, just his entrance alone was, I mean, it was, it was, it was way too long for me, but again, it was that that's him. And then Tyson came out with his typical Tyson entrance. I'm going to come out. I'm going to walk. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to look miserable. I'm look like I'm going to fucking kill you. But when he came down to it, it just, it's a work. Yeah. Boxing has just done a lot better job at keeping kayfabe alive in their sport than we have in professional wrestling. Right. Um, but you know, it's it's a lot of it with the Tyson fight, I feel at least it's nostalgia. Nostalgia sells. Look no further than Ric Flair's last match, which transitions us into the next part of this conversation. There are reports that are saying Tyson had a leg injury. Uh, you know, that Tyson had this and that going on, that he was sick. Um, he just had eight blood transfusions, however long before the fight. Um, but, you know, Ric Flair's last match, have you seen that that, that match, Ric Flair's last? I, I saw bits and pieces, yes. I didn't watch the whole thing, but I've seen bits and pieces, yes. Uh, it's a tough watch. You know, watching him come down to the ring was awesome. Watching him getting in strut. And then, as they say in the business, Chaz, and then the bell rang. Right. And it wasn't so much for me that it was sloppy or that he was slow. I was I was worried. I was nervous that we were going to watch this legend, this icon, this mythical entity of the world of professional wrestling die before our very eyes. And yeah. Tyson wasn't so much in that, you know, same realm. But it's like matches like The Undertaker. The Undertaker-Goldberg match was physically pained me to see it so then that beckons the question from you a guy at your age that has you have injuries but you've kept up with your body you've kept up with your nutrition your 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 faculties are still there but then there's other guys that their time has come and gone and it's really hard as you know to let go of the addiction that is pro wrestling but Chaz where do you feel someone should draw the line it, 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 it is hard to kill the addiction off of, of wrestling and being in front of people. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if you, we, we all know that the flair story, his, his, his gimmick was real. He lived that every day of his life. So he spent money and he did all of those, that fancy stuff he always talked about in his promos. Um, so if you need the money, you get, so my, my thing has always been like, people say to me, well, how long are you going to keep doing it? And my answer is, as long as I'm having fun, as long as I feel I can still keep up with the kids in the ring, I said, and as long as someone will pay me. Yep. Cause the, the pay thing is, is, is the biggest part because if no one's going to pay you, then you don't have a job anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like professional football players. They you're like, Oh, well, why'd you retire? Well, no one was signing me. So you got to figure something else out. Um, I, I just think as long as you, and again, it goes back to the pay part, as long as someone's going to pay you then and you're going to draw money, then you're still going to keep doing it. Now, as far as what you do in the ring changes, like Glenn and I have changed what we do a lot. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really, unless it's, unless it's like an NWA or WWE pay-per-view, because I did it, um, when we went back to WWE and I just did it last year in the NWA pay-per-view, the inside out clothesline where I hit the, in, the inside rope and I dive over the top rope. Mm-hmm. I'm not really doing that anymore unless it's like a, a big show or a special thing um, or a bunch of my friends are there and I want to show off. Um, but it's just, <laughs> um, so, you know, you tailor down what you do. An example I have is a 
few years ago, a few years ago, it was probably like 10 years ago, we got called by to do um, Juggalo Championship Wrestling. Oh. The they did. And we were in this giant Legends Battle Royal. And I'm looking around at the people in the locker room, and, you know, there's Bob Orton, and Piper was there, and Hacksaw Jim Duggan. and Holy cow. And, and so it was guys of that caliber. And I'm like, first of all, how am I – considered a legend with any of them. <laughs> but long story short our ring entrance our music hits and glenn and i are standing there and i go do you want to go first or you want me to go first he's like i don't care in my mind i said oh well, this battle royal has been going on for a while so it'll be people in the ring i'm like i'll go first and i ran out i didn't realize i was the second person going out that's how much i was paying attention and there was hacksaw jim duggan in the middle of the ring and I'm like, shit. So I, I'm get down in the ring, and I, I'm going in the ring. I'm thinking the whole time, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with him? Like, yeah, you guys hadn't called anything, right? No. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with him. Like, I, So we get in the ring, and I go to lock up with him. And I go, what are we doing? And he, no lie, he goes, this is what we're doing. He reaches down and gives me a double titty twister. And he was jumping up there. And I went, Okay, so I went back and I grabbed his, and we went <laughs> we went back and forth for like two or three minutes. And we, I mean, we did some more stuff, but that that was the cue to me. Hey, we're just coming out here. We're going to make these people laugh. We're going to have a good time. So now there's other people in the ring, and then all of a sudden the music hits. It's Jimmy Superfly Snuka. It took him no lie five minutes to get to the ring because he was walking so slow and he was mm. hobbling. And then he took, like, it was another two minutes to get up onto the apron, up the steps. And then and then he, as he slowly got, like, guys went over and, like, lifted the ropes, like, helped him into the ring. And as he stood there doing his, you know, like, his stuff, I looked at Hacksaw and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm out. And I grabbed Hacksaw and I jumped myself over the top rope. Like, I wanted nothing to do Mark. With, that thing, with him being in the ring because I was literally afraid. Like you said, watching Flair, you were afraid he was going to get hurt. I was 100% legit scared he was going to get hurt or something. And That's I best case off. scenario. Getting, yeah. hurt, getting hurt at that age and that condition is best case scenario. Yeah, I mean, and then after the show, I don't want to get into it after the show and stuff like that, which is going to say, so I'm sorry, I cut that off. Um, but yeah, he just wasn't, just should, at that point, you shouldn't have been doing it. And if you're going to bring someone out like that, or... Like me, if I get to that point and someone wants to pay me because they think I can help and, you know, help promote or whatever, and I can be a draw still, I, you got to have a team around you that says, listen, you can't get in the ring. Like walk out where if you do get into the ring, there's no action going on. It's just you. Maybe you come out and do a little, hey, how you doing? Thanks for seeing me. Take some pictures, sign some autographs or convention or something and get the hell out because you're yeah. just going to get hurt. Um, so again, for me, it's a matter of, you know, you, you can't really fault guys for getting in the ring, but the guys have to be smart enough to go, okay, this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. This is all I want to do. Um, so you don't get hurt, you know, and then the guys before me are way different because they're more beat up than I even am. Yeah. Good um, point. Because, you know, and, it, and now that now it's way different because when we were there, like when I was with WWE back in the day, when we were there full time, we didn't have trainers. We didn't have doctors. We didn't have all that. Like, if you got a, a, a – like, one night I got cut open. Like, we just took some super glue and just put the super glue on it. Like, okay, it'll, it'll close up. Like, that – those were – we were our own doctors. Like, we did our own stuff. Al Snow was my chiropractor from Smoky Mountain for however long we were there. Holy we cow. Could, he could adjust us. He would crack our neck, and he would rub stuff out. And, you know, that's – that. he was our chiropractor. And now it's different, and now they don't work as much as we did. So they'll be able to go a lot longer. Um, yeah, so as far as you just have to know when it's time. And, like, Glenn and I last – was it last year? It was last year. Yeah, it was last year. We thought about having a last match. Mm. We actually talked to Danny at the Monster Factory. Danny was going to help promote it. We wanted to do it at the Monster Factory, or at least have the Monster Factory host it. Um, and we were going to work um, Brian and Matt, Brian Myers and Matt Cardona. They were going to be our final match. Can I can I manage you guys in your last match? Sure. So we were ready, 100% prepared to do that. And then 
we got the Legends contract with WWE. And we we're oh, like, well, yeah. you're going to get booked on more stuff. And we don't want to say you have a – I don't want to be that this is our last match and then have five more matches. I want to have a last match and be done. You think um, you think you will announce your official retirement? Because they say anybody that announces their retirement isn't actually retiring. Um, I mean, at that point, I was a actually – to be totally transparent at that point, I was actually ready to say that was going to be Glenn and mine last match together because Glenn, oh. Glenn was basically done, but I still enjoy it. I'd like, I'll still do singles matches. Like I don't care. Um, so I was going to, my promotion of it was going to be our last headbangers, last tag team match together. Um, because Glenn's like, he was just kind of done. Um, he's, he enjoys the conventions and stuff, but getting in the ring, he's not having so much fun anymore with that. Because his body's a little bit more beat up than mine from taking that, doing that leg drop for 30 yeah. years. <laughs> now, Chad, um, you mentioned something very interesting. The guys before you and how beat up they are. I mean, we've seen the condition. Iron Sheik at the Gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania 17. Um, and then, you know, your generation, the Attitude Era, with the style of today's performers – and the outrageous risks that some of these guys are taking. What do you think a guy like Darby Allen is going to be like in 25, 30 years? Um, it's hard to say. And it's only the only reason I'm saying it's hard to say. And, I, and I'll give you a, a person as an example in a minute. Um, it's hard to say because their schedules aren't like ours was. Mm. We were on the road. 250 to 300 days a year. There was one year where Glenn and I were doing personal appearances and house shows. We, it was, we were gone 316 days. Holy cow. Yeah, we were gone 316 days. I went back to Austin 316. See how I said that? <laughs> <laughs> Just popped into my head. Um, but no, we were gone 316 days that year. And that was doing TV, house shows, and appearances. Um, you know, the main roster was always 250-ish, 260 days. You know, you factor in, you're gone, you're doing four or five shows a week, and we don't have an off-season. You know, it was, it was all the time. So, guys now, it's different. Like, you know, NXT guys, those guys are flying all over the place. But at the same time, two shows a week? Yep. Two or three shows a week? You know, they're doing TV, and, and now they're learning – how to with the doctor. And when you go to the performance center, there's a full medical facility there with doctors and trainers and they got them stretching or working them out. Like it's, it's a full blown, like I'm trying to think of a great, like it's like a health club in there where you have doctors and trainers like helping you and fixing you. And, you know, back in, back in, back in my day, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't, <laughs> you, didn't you didn't want time off. You didn't ask for time off. If you got hurt, you still tried to go back. You still tried to show up and work. Because once you lost your spot on TV, mm. you had to now wait for a spot to open to work your way back in. Nowadays, you can ask for time off. They give you time off. If you're hurt, they say, nope, don't come back till you're 100%. But you still have your spot. They still work it back in. So it's a, just a different time now. So the guys now are going to last longer unless, like, the AEW guys are doing all that crap um, – on you know regular indie shows and stuff yeah. my example is jeff hardy and matt mm -hmm. so when they first came in so glenn and i worked them in smoky mountain they did jobs for us in smoky mountain and then um when they got to wf like glenn and i pulled them aside and we're like you guys need to slow down a little bit like you're here house shows and stuff you don't have to be crazy save it for tv save it for big spots save it for big moments and i mean you know, look at look what happened. They both just beat each other, beat their bodies up so much. You know, Jeff had ended up with his demons, Matt had his, his stuff. But, you know, thankfully, they're both great now and are healthy and are doing really well, Which and I love them both to death. But they had to learn that, and they had to learn it quickly because they realized quickly that Glenn and I were right. Like, the stuff Glenn and I were doing in Smoky Mountain and how we got there and the stuff we did on TV, we didn't do all that on house shows all the time. Because, again, we had the older guys telling us, all right, house shows, have fun, slow down, and figure it out. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just different. But they don't really have house shows anymore either. Yeah. That, uh, that resonates so deeply with me because um, 
near the end of my training, Bubba and Devon decided that, I mean, we just, you, you mentioned it on the show last week when we had Pete Gas on. Um, I've got a lot of health issues. I should have never been in the ring um, and injuries have accumulated. So Bubba and Devon suggested that I be a manager. And I did that for a year when I first started. <clears throat> when I first transitioned into in-ring competition, Chaz, you can't find a Simon Says match between 2009 till 2011 where I'm not taking a back body drop on the floor of every venue we're in. And guys, the elder guys would pull me aside and say, what are you doing? You can talk. You don't have to take these stupid bumps and stupid risks. Be a, be a chicken shit heel. Use your mouth. Use your promos. Um, but I had it stuck in my head that I had to impress the boys and that I had to show people that I was tough. Not looking like a wrestler, not having a physique. I had to go out and prove that I belonged. And it was, I, you know. And that's a, that's a different, that's a mindset that a lot of people have, not realizing it's just the opposite. It's true. Yeah. And what, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is you going out there and killing yourself and taking backdrops on the floor in front of 100 people. Older guys like me, we're not going, oh, my God, look at that guy's impressing me by doing it. We're like, that guyy's a freaking moron. <laughs> exactly. Like, he's, yeah. he's hurting himself. What impresses us more is working smart, going, hey, I have a gift. I can talk. I can get. If I have to take a bump, it's going to mean something at the right spot. It's not going to be just a regular, I'm going to go out to the floor, like you said, and take a backdrop mm -hmm. on the floor because I want to impress everybody. Impressing everyone is knowing your, knowing when to do it, when not to do it, when to say something, when not to say something. That's what it's all about. That's something that's going to impress me and the older generation more than going out. I mean, the kids that – and I say kids, you know, that are that are training together at the school, they may be like, oh, man, that was really awesome. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's going to get you hurt. Yep. That's or, that's they, or, or I've learned that bigger companies will say he's, he's, a, he's a liability risk. We can't keep this guy employed if he's going to keep taking these stupid bumps and then be on the shelf all the time. Uh, right. And it's so you are so right in what you just said, because I took five years off when my little one was born, when Harry was born. And ever since I've come back uh Forget the fact that I feel like Bob Backlund in 92. All of a sudden, I came back, and I was the older guy, and all my my, my, my contemporaries and my little cliques were gone. Um, but I've learned to rely more on this than the bumps. And now I feel like more than ever, I'm getting guys that have been on TV or older guys that, that have taken notice. Like, wow, Simon, uh, you know, good heat. Or, or, man, you really had them. And I'm doing less physicality right. and, and more of the and stuff you're saying. And the other, the other part of that that happens is you pitch your toe, pigeon toe yourself into a certain, a certain realm of the business. Like, oh, you got this guy. Oh, he only does hardcore matches. Like, he can't have a regular match. Like Axel, Axel <laughs> Rotten, one of the one of the best workers, one of the most best psychology, best person I ever met. I think I told you the story of how I have this, but oh I'm yeah, yeah. Right um. Axel was an amazing worker, but he was only really known for the hardcore stuff he did because that's what he did at ECW, and that's what he ended up enjoying. So you pigeon toe yourself into a certain spot where no other bigger company, especially in the indies, they're going to want you because you're kind of that guy, and then you're all scarred up and marked up, and nobody wants to see that. You and know, then like, the fans expect it too. Right. So that's what they expect to see. So this segues into what you had, what you had mentioned before, of uh, talking about being able to do promos and 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 how that factors in. So, Great transition. John and I, I'm going to use two examples: John Cena and The Rock. Mm. I mean, and then you can throw Hogan in this also, but I'm going to I'm going to stay with with The Rock and with John Cena. Both of them can cut amazing promos. John Cena is probably one of the best to ever do it, in my opinion. And the reason I say that is he can he can riff. He can go with the flow. He can riff. He can come up with the stuff right then and there. The Rock was great at it, but The Rock had a writer. Yep. And The Rock had to memorize all his stuff. And but he couldn't riff like John Cena could. But John his delivery Cena was good. It. Well, yeah, and he knew how to deliver it and he just knew how he knew when to do it. Um, but the charisma side and being able to talk is actually more important than 
to being able to wrestle or work wise. Um, I mean, Paul Hogan's work is terrible. I mean, let's be honest, it's not good, but his charisma and his ability to cut a promo was, was amazing. I mean, how many times as a kid do you listen to Hulk Hogan or even watch those back and you still get goosebumps to this day? Yeah. You know, The Rock's charisma and personality, and I, I think we talked about this before, maybe with Glenn, was The Rock was doing that elbow. And we, oh, were, yeah. like, we were like, Rock, what are you doing? Like, you're hitting his arm. Like, you got to lean into it. He's like, no, this is how I want to do it. And, both. and we're like, that's dumb. That's the biggest fucking move ever. Like, who's <laughs> dumb now? <laughs> but my point is, the work... <laughs> The work wasn't great, but he knew how to tell the story. He knew how to get the promo over, and he worked with great people, with Hunter and Sean and Steve mm -hmm. and Taker. He worked with all the great people that were able to take his strengths and highlight them and bury his his weaknesses. And that was what made him, that's what made Cena great. When John Cena hits the ropes, it drives me batty. <laughs> he kicked he <laughs> his leg in the air, and I hate it. Like, I, and I hate all that. This, like, when when I first started seeing it, I'm like, this is so dumb. I was never a, I was never, I thought for me being, because I like the realism part of it. If you're in a real fight, you know, that's how I was trained. Like, you don't want to give them time to run the ropes this way, run the ropes that way, and then run, you know, you run past them four times. Why aren't you just going to stand up? Yeah. But, and I realize now it's more, it's more about the performance. It's more about, you know, being entertained. And I get that it's different now. But I couldn't stand all of that. Um, but, you know, they did what they were able to take their personality, their charisma, and get it across on the microphone like no one else could. I mean, Chazer, you knowing me the way you do, you know it's going to physically hurt me to say this. You mentioned Cena. You mentioned Rock. You mentioned Hogan. You could even throw the Grand Pooba, my spirit animal, Stone Cold Steve Austin in that list. Austin was a great worker. We saw his work in WCW, oh, but amazing. there's there's it's been on it's been on on record. Lots of guys, Jim Ross, whoever said that um as as bad as it sounds to say, Austin getting his neck hurt was the best thing that could have happened for his career because the promos and just going around, you know, hitting the stunner on people on Raw and on pay-per-views, that you know probably propelled him to the atmosphere of superstardom that he reached and he wasn't in there having full matches he had to really scale down his in-ring you know maneuvers and spots and all that jazz and just became a brawler but his promos were out of this world his, his believability the charisma i mean you worked with the guy you know you got to take a stunner i'm so jealous ground zero 97 and and you felt that roar from the crowd firsthand well well, let, let, let's correct Ground Zero from 97 because Steve's neck actually benefited us because him and him and Dude Love mm -hmm. were tag champs and weren't able to defend their title. So we took their spot. Yep. And Steve came in and stunned Owen. And then I covered and pinned to Owen. Oh, that's, that's right. That wasn't you. Think, wishful thinking in my head. So did you ever get the I mean, I had, I had taken the stunner multiple times. I'm just saying at that pay per view. That's when we won the belts. Yep, and then and then there's that. Yes, <laughs> but hey, no, you're you right. Have... Steve Steve was an awesome worker, um, and I don't know if you, I'm sure you have, but the, the the story behind Austin 316 came out of that King of the Ring pay per view, and it came from Michael Hayes calling Steve and saying, "Hey, here's what's going to happen. You know, you're going to go out, and you're going to go over on Jake." Jake's going to cut a promo. All of Jake's promos were all about God and the Bible and this verse and that verse. And Steve had it just out of nowhere, just was like Austin 316 just whooped your ass. Because in Steve's mind, he's always seeing John 316, John 316, John 316. And he just spit it out. And that's what took him off was that's that amazing. right there. Yeah. Chaz, no, you're 100 percent right. Steve was great on the mic. Steve was a great worker. And like you said, Steve figured out a way to keep himself over because of the injury to keep yeah. going and stuff like that. I mean, even later on in his career, when he and Kurt Angle were both on the shelf, they were doing the comedic stuff with the Alliance and the guitar and the little cowboy hat, you yeah. know, to, to people that grew up 
during that era, that's some of the most memorable segments uh, and situations there were. Um, did you ever get a chance to work with Steve one on one, Jazz? Did you ever get to have a match with him? No. Or just take the stunner? Just took the stunner. Never even did a tag match against him. Just the stunner. Man, how crazy is that? Of, just, of all um, the time you guys spent on the roster together. Well, li listen, let's be honest. Steve was up here and we were down here. Like, I can't even be on camera. That's how low we were in the totem pole. Um, <laughs> um, no, what Steve was, you know, like I said, Steve was up here. We were down here and we were. We were the guys to help get them over. And that was our job. And that's what we did. And it's actually what happened with one of the things with the insane, insane clown posse. Then it killed it off when they were putting us together as a faction. They didn't like the fact that Steve came out and stunned all four of us. We're like, mm -hmm. he's freaking stone cold Steve Austin. Like this is, we're getting Steve. We're making money because of Steve. Like people say to me, do you like Steve? No, I love Steve. Steve's amazing. <laughs> I made a lot of money because of Steve. I made a lot of money because of the rock and DX. But you know, that was our role was to help get those guys over that were drawing money. So which made us make money. So, yeah, we never worked them. That's awesome. Well, gang, we're right at the 30 minute mark. Thank you for sitting with us on another episode of the Mosh and Says Show. Our Facebook fan page will be going live this week. All Whoa. of our episodes. Yeah. Yeah. That's They'll exciting. be synchronized. On that page, we're working on uploading the audio for those of you that want to take the show on the go with you so you don't have to sit on YouTube. Uh, it'll be up on Spotify, Google Play, Stitch, uh, Apple Podcasts. And uh, you can leave us reviews on there, too. Five-star reviews if you feel we've earned it. So far, all of the, uh, the feedback we've gotten has been positive. So thank you guys for all of the likes. We would appreciate it if you would share the show. You don't know how much that means to us, to the success of the show. The more you share, the more eyes and ears we get on us. We're working on getting some exciting stuff done, uh, some merchandise, some special guests on. But speaking of merch, that shirt that is right behind Chaz's right shoulder, there is there the link. It, it's still going on. Again, you go to the link right there. You, you cast me a vote. You get a shirt. And then you actually go into the raffle for a signed set of these puppies a sign set and guys clicking the link casting a vote for chaz that is the only way you can get that team mosh shirt it is the not only sold way you get it it won't be sold anywhere else that's it and that's it so you sell them there's about there's actually only about a hundred um that were made total and i think we have maybe 20 25 left because i did an event monday night and we sold a bunch there so well, and and uh, that's it. That's the only chance you're going to be able to get them. Well, I'll be casting my vote because I want one of them. But, gang, also don't forget you can get Headbangers merch on WWEshop.com at select hot topics of your local area. Check them out, and you can check out ringsidecollectibles.com if you want to purchase your own set of the Headbangers figures. But they will not be signed. You have to enter the raffle to get your signed set signed. on behalf. Of one half of my favorite tag team. He is Mosh. I am says we will be here next week. Once again, same headbanger time, same headbanger channel. And um, says set it off. We're out. <laughs>